I'm really delighted to be here. Any opportunity to have a conversation with Gabriel is a great opportunity because we have become very good friends through this process. It's, it's a wonderful thing uh, for someone who generally works on art of the 19th century um, to actually be able to deal with a living artist. It comes with challenges, not so in the case of Gabriel, um, but you can have these conversations about motivation, um, process, what makes an artist tick. And so you'll have the opportunity tonight um, to ask those questions of Gabriel, but I'll uh, start us off with a conversation. I just wanted to put this slide up. This was um, taken by a friend of mine who was witnessing the installation. And this is pretty much the reaction to Plexus number 34. And I'm glad that you got to walk through it before you came in here. Sometimes we talk about exhibitions, you haven't seen the exhibition yet, so you're just using your imagination. But um, you were able to see that this piece is at the heart of the museum and it really does something for Philip Johnson's architecture um, and Gabriel's work to be in conversation with each other. But I encourage you to keep your sense of wonder as you interact with this piece. It changes over the course of a day, over the course of seasons, so come back, see it often, dance under it, lie down on the floor, security's not in here, right? Lie down on the floor <laughs> and capitalize on that childlike sense of wonder that Brett's daughter has automatically that we tend to lose. Because that to me is the reason to have this work in the museum, is to remind us that it's okay to marvel, that it's okay to experience an art, a work of art. It's more than okay. It's wonderful to experience a work of art that stirs up emotions, that makes you feel happy, that reminds you that there's beauty and joy in the world. Um, I just have to make a plug. Um, in our gift shop tonight, um, we have these limited edition artist books that chronicle um, the process of making uh, Plexus 34 and speak a little bit about Gabriel's um, intentions and the, the role that this work plays within the history of art. So there's an essay by me, an essay by Gabriel, and the books are signed. Um, so if you are a member, you get a discount. So the shop will be open, and I encourage you to, uh, to purchase the book. It is a labor of love, and it's really a beautiful art object in and of itself. So I realized I didn't actually introduce Gabriel to you. I just talked about the piece. So <laughs> this is Gabriel Daw. Hi, everyone. I'm the associate curator here at the Eamon Carter. Gabriel uh, hails originally from Mexico, but has made a life for himself in Texas. So he is an artist of international renown who lives in our backyard. Uh, <laughs> Dallas is our backyard. That's very important. <laughs> <we're laughs> <in. laughs> uh, so we're, we're just uh, thrilled. So um, could you tell me a little bit about how you got your start as an artist? Were you born an artist, or um, were you made? <laughs> Um, I grew up, like you said, in Mexico City, um, and I grew up very much um, encouraged to be art art artistic. Um, however, when I decided to choose a profession, I decided to study graphic design. Um, art was sort of in my it, it was one of my options, but I decided to do graphic design. And I had a lot of misconceptions about what an artist uh, was. So uh, I was a graphic designer for a number of years um, until I couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually loved being a graphic designer. I really did. Um, but then one day came that I really didn't love it anymore. So... Uh, and it was actually a pretty much anguishing uh, period <laughs> because I really, I couldn't really take it anymore. So uh, I really wanted the creative freedom. Um, so one day I decided to quit my job and become an artist. <laughs> that's it. That's how I became an artist. I was living in Montreal at the time. Um, I very... Uh, very naively thought that I was going to make a living out of it right away um, and um, now I do which is awesome but <laughs> it took a while um, it took a few years to start getting some traction it, 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 in fact it was 
Well, I think it was not until I went back to grad school and uh, what I did in grad school that sort of really gave power to what I was doing, I guess, is mm -hmm. what I... So this was not the first series that you did uh, emerging from your graphic design career. So do you want to yeah. tell the audience a little bit about um, what came first and... The yeah, so um, at first I was just doing collage and painting and dabbling and trying to find uh, my voice as an artist. And I remembered this childhood frustration um, growing up in Mexico City. Um, my mom's family is um, like very conservative and uh, very match oriented where girls are in the kitchen, boys go out and play, they should not dabble in sewing and stuff like that. Um, so my grandmother would teach my sister to embroider, but she wouldn't teach me. Um, so I remember that um, and uh, I took embroidery as a means of challenging those ideas of machismo and uh, of my upbringing. Um, and the very, very first piece I did was this very angry piece um, <laughs> that was... Sort of directed at your grandmother? Right, yeah. yeah. And, uh, <laughs> no, and uh, it was definitely directed at my... Not sort of. Okay. Like very straight direct. <laughs> it was, yeah, I'm just trying to find the word to say what it was. Because it, it was kind of like a it was pornographic aggressive. image. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It was a pornographic image, and it was like, mm, screw you. <laughs> um, and then uh, the pieces I started doing after um, were actually um, sort of little details blown up. Of uh, We have some. Well, well, actually, that's the very second piece I did. <laughs> but then I started doing these pieces, which are um, little details of postage stamps. And... Um, I see it as a coming to terms with that relationship with my grandmother because she used to collect postage stamps and she actually gave me her collection. Um, and I loved, uh, like, I loved stamps. Uh, I used to collect stamps. And um, so, uh, and also sort of being a graphic designer, like the type Typography and postage stamps, and actually my thesis as a graphic designer was, uh, or my, not a dissertation, but my, final, my finishing project was uh, postage stamp design. Um, so th uh, this type of work to me represents that sort of coming to terms with uh, that history with my grandmother. Um, and then it went on to the, the, the Fear series, which um, it was taking that. Uh, it was such a, a, um, an anguishing time for me, um, sort of jumping jumping into the void and becoming an artist. Um, so this series is about fear. It's the fear series, and it, it, it's sort of how. Well, to me, it represents how if you don't deal with your fears, it will crawl on you like <laughs> giant insects. <laughs> so those are done all in, in, in pieces of shirts, plaid shirts. And this is all before graduate school? Yes. And so then um, that's what brought you to Texas. Well, that's one of the reasons you right. ended up in Texas. Uh, grad school, yeah. I went to UT Dallas um, where I was actually not doing an MFA. I was doing an MA in aesthetic studies. Um, and I really liked that program because you had a lot of flexibility. You can still do the studio work. Um, and then when I was about to graduate when it was when um, I was encouraged by one of my professors, Greg Metz, who is a local artist. Um, and he really encouraged me to go for the MFA, um, which I did, and I'm really happy. Um, and actually, what I really loved about that program was the Central Track, which uh, is the artist in residency program that it's sort of in limbo right now, unfortunately. Um, but that's sort of this, the the residency is what gave me the space to create the work, uh, the Plexus series work. 
and explain um, the origin of the Plexus series, what you were trying to achieve, the significance of the title? Um, so, um, while at Central Track, I was working on embroidery, I was working on sculpture. Um, um, yeah. Um, with sort of textile sculpture. Um, and except for this piece, all the work is really small scale. Like this is an actual pair of pants, but um, these, uh, these pieces of, wor of work were really small. Well, and, and medium size, but I really wanted to make something like really big. Um, and then uh, Carissa Terranova, one of my other professors at UT Dallas and the director of Central Track at the time, she, um, she created this show uh, pairing artists that use fashion in some way or another with architects. And we, um, uh, we were encouraged to explore the relationships uh, between fashion and architecture. And that's when the idea finally sort of came together and um, which was making an architectural structure with the core material of clothing. Um, and I was doing some tests in the studio and one day I looked at I had a 15 by 15 foot uh, wall and I was like, well, what would happen if I just cover this whole wall in? And that's this, right? Right. <laughs> so that's the, that's the wall and um, wow. <laughs> I literally went up and down that ladder like thousands of times. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's how, it, and it was just a big experiment. It was just um, it was just trying to see what would happen, um, trying to interchange those, the scale of one into the other, and, um, and just, you know, it, it, it seemed a little bit futile in a sense, just grabbing this little, like, really tiny strand of thread uh, and just going, like, single by, like, one by one, just going up and down a ladder. So um, there's an element to your work that's a bit obsessive. Just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. For Does sure. that <clears throat> sort of relieve your obsessive tendencies? You just yeah. put it all into the work? Yeah, definitely. And what do you think? So you, you were inspired by the notion of the connection between architecture and fashion. Mm -hmm. And so what did you discover from doing this? Um, you know, at the very beginning, I was sort of thinking about what fashion, fashion is clothing, basically, at its basic, at, at most basic is just clothing, uh, and architecture, at its most basic, is a place that gives us shelter, so both things gives us shelter, like physical shelter, in one way or another, but um, either immediate, like, next to the body or, you know, a roof over your head. Um, and uh, I kind of felt that what happened when I was doing these architectural structures with, this, with the material of, uh, of clothing is that that sheltering quality, it, even though you, you would know, like the way it's used, it's, not, it's no longer sheltering the body physically, it just, it's still, it gets transformed. Um, so there's this transformation of the sheltering quality that it, it translates into a soothing of the psyche or uh, the senses uh, in, in a metaphorical way instead of a physical way. So the, the plexus term, what does that mean the for those term. of us not biologists? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so when I was... Um, I'm not one with words. Uh, uh, so whenever I name something, I like to find a name that I can serialize. Um, and therefore, you know, you have plexus number one, two, three, four, five. And I was looking for something that, um, you know, that, that gave a little bit of 
of meaning of, more, uh, of to what I was doing or represented the meaning of what I was doing. Um, and I just was on, uh, on a dictionary and I found the word plexus and um, or thesaurus or something like that. And I, I realized that it... Um, it conveyed, uh, I mean, plexus is a network of vessel, of blood vessels or nerve endings in the body. So it kind of conveyed that uh, network quality of the work. Because what I'm doing is some sort of network. And in a sense, it's connecting what you're doing to the architecture around it. So there's right. another kind right. of connection. I think it has some like, just physical aspects to it and the metaphorical. Me- metaphorical. <laughs> So was there something about Texas and being in Texas that um, encouraged you to work with light? Or was that always something that was part of your analysis, part of your... No, I mean, the, the, the light aspect beca- um, came after doing two of them and realizing that the result is so ethereal and it was... Um, it kind of looked like light. So uh, for plexus number three, I kind of uh, decided to go with the full spectrum just to reinforce that idea. And um, I was really scared of it at the beginning because I didn't, I didn't want it to be like, oh, it's a rainbow. Um, and I thought it was going to take away from the work. Uh, but I think, in fact, it actually makes the, the, the work stronger. One of the things I've noticed is that, and this was true of the fact that I first encountered your work through magazines, mm-hmm. there's kind of a questioning of, is what I'm seeing actually an effect of light and colored light projected onto some surface, or is it is in, in the string? And I think we were just, or in the thread, we were just speaking about this before everybody came in. Um, I think part of what you're trying to achieve is a questioning and then a shutting off of the questioning um, in the part of the person who comes to visit this piece. So you just want to talk a little bit about what you hope the visitor experience is of your work? Um, well, you know, I think um, I think one of the strengths of the work is that it manages to stop you on your tracks and it really brings you to present moment. Um, and I, I think that's really one of uh, uh, the achievements of the work that it just brings you to the now and um, I, I just want people to experience and there's this sort of like you said at the beginning like there's this child, childlike sense of wonder that we lose as we grow up um, and it's very refreshing to see people uh, like adults walk into the space and just Literally, job, uh, jaws drop, um, and to me that is a sign that that I'm doing something right, and um, that the work is doing something for people. And it's really sort of making people get in touch with something deeper within them. Is there a connection for you, art historically, with other artists who have been of influence to you? It's not all fiber artists. Right. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I grew up going, going, going to museums and um, very, I have, a, um, you know, very fond memories of going to the, in Mexico City, to the Museum of Modern Art, Museo de Arte Moderno. And um, there's a lot of abstract, um, exp- not abstract expression, but Geometric uh, abstraction, mm-hmm. um, like I don't know Victor Vasarely. Uh, like I loved Victor Vasarely growing up. Um, I, I loved. Oh gosh, I'm blanking out. But <laughs> yeah, but I mean, in, in more recent, like in terms of influences. I mean, I think um, there's there's many artists. Like there's. Um, 
Anish Kapoor is definitely one of my uh, biggest influences um, in the sense that he manages to capture physically what is not physical. Mm -hmm. So he has to stare you into a black hole, square into a wall, stare into the infinite. Mm. Um, to me, that's really powerful work. Um, and I, I didn't necessarily set up to try to achieve that, but um, I think, um, in a sense, um, there's... Um, I'm trying, I guess. <laughs> um, and, you know, and there's people like James Terrell, obviously, that um, work with light and um, who are a big um, inspiration and influence. So light is as important to you as color in these right. works. Yeah. yeah. I think that's something that people sometimes don't understand because they're seeing your work through reproductions. It's right. so different to have the experience in the space. Yeah. Um, Many of your works are temporary. Do you yeah. want to talk a little bit about the rationale for that and what that means to you? Well, part of it is just practical because not everybody's going to be able to keep these pieces for um, forever um, or have the space dedicated to a piece like this. Um, so for the most part, they're temporary exhibitions. And, um, you know, I mean... Since the beginning, the work was meant, to, or not necessarily meant to be temporary, but the, the nature of the exhibitions were temporary. So um, it never felt, um, I don't know, I never really got, the only piece I was really set to take down was this one, which was the, the first one. And it's a piece I lived with for a while, so um, it's, I think it, 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 it's different, but um, it, I see it as this meditation of life and death because mm -hmm. um, the pieces have a life and then they die and then borrowing from Catholic lore, uh, they become a relic. So, yeah, these are relics. Um, so they come down and they have this second life or afterlife, if you will. And, um, and it's beautiful in itself and they become the opposite of what the installations are. The installations are expansive, ethereal, geometric, and then they come down and it's dense, um, organic, and compact. So we... <laughs> no. Um, so the question other... was, do you cut them? Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, usually the only rule when that I give museums um, when they're taking pieces down is that they can't cut them. It just... Um, it's just unattached. It's yeah. a very fast process. I think there's something about the weightlessness and then the density of these that yeah. really makes it come full circle. Oh, yeah. Because also, also, I mean, it, it has a weight to it. So it's very, um, uh, I don't know, they're, they're tactile. They're, um, it has a metamorphosis to something else. It, it does, yeah. Um, I forgot to mention that these pieces are site-specific, so they're designed yeah. for the space that they inhabit. And so the next question is, why the Eamon Carter? How did this process come about? You know, What were you thinking as you walked into the building? I, w I know I was thinking, I hope he agrees to do this, and I was trying <laughs> to impress him, and I think at the same time Gabriel was thinking, I hope they agree to do this. So <laughs> it was a kind of delicate dance. But Yeah, well, um, I mean, I've, I've been coming to the Eamon Carter since before I was doing the installations, so when I started doing the installations, I really thought this would be an an ideal place for one of them. Uh, and especially at the beginning, I don't do that anymore, but, or not as much. Uh, but any space I would be in, I would try to, like, I, I would start thinking, what can I do here? Yeah. Uh, and so this, uh, this space was, I mean, it's also a very intimidating space because, um, well, not only is it, it's, you know, it's, Philip Johnson is just uh, you know iconic architect and um, it, it, the vastness of it is just so big um, that just the idea of achieving something here um, 
was a little bit mind-boggling. <laughs> um, yeah, even now that I see it, it, it it's, uh, it's a little bit mind-boggling that we were able to achieve that. Agreed. Shout out to Francisco. <laughs> Francisco is here, one of uh, the helpers on the project. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and so we had a meeting. You looked at the space. Um, you went back to the studio. You already had the idea in your head, or...? No, I mean... Um, you know, it's always different from project to project. Some project, some some spaces are just really immediate, uh, and it's like, oh, it's very clear what needs to happen here. Uh, this one, uh, well, and the other type of projects, they need to simmer down. Not uh, like not simmer down, but Percolate. simmer. Yeah. Like just <laughs> yeah. stay in the back of my mind for a little bit, and just sort of. Ponder without pondering. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but you know, like not necessarily actively thinking, but present in my mind, and that's how a lot of uh, ideas come. Um, this piece was somewhere in between. Um, like I said in the video, like it's such a symmetrical space um, that I really wanted to respect that. Um, uh, symmetry is uh, one of those things that, um, I mean, I love using symmetry, but I judge myself too much uh, for using it, or I judge myself for using it too much. Um, but I really felt that it was the right solution here. And also, I mean, um, it's a symmetry that's it's broken depending on where you are in the space, but uh, depending on how you look at it. But uh, but it is a symmetrical piece. But I really wanted to to, to respect the space, and uh, I think that um, uh, what's the right word? Um, that sense of um, maybe reverence. Reverence. Yeah. Yeah, that's the word. Um, is is what. Um, led me to to do that. And I think one of the unexpected things is the prospect of seeing the rest of our collection through the haze of your work. I yeah. don't think I really understood that from the drawings from, I think I have, no, maybe I don't, um, <laughs> from the plans that you drew up. That, yeah, you that, do. That, yeah, I do. You do have them. <laughs> that there's... Um, that there's a whole other aspect to the experience of the work that you right. see from, from upstairs. Um, so you're seeing um, our works of art through your lens. Yeah. Um, and so there becomes a connection to the, yeah. the past. Yeah, and that's something that doesn't happen often because sometimes it's just an, uh, an empty space where I'm in. Um, but that dialogue, that... Um, Happens when there's actual other, actually other type of work in the space, uh, particularly if it's work from another era. I think it's really fascinating, and um, it it just it's a wonderful dialogue. I mean, for us, those of us who study the 19th century, there's something of the sublime, and yeah. I mean, I know you're not trying to replicate nature, right. but there's something in the experience that's like the experience of nature. <laughs> no, yeah, I see it. I, I, mean, I totally see it. It's just he resists the term um, rainbows, but when yeah. in life do you stop everything you're doing to take a picture of something <laughs> um, more so than when you see a rainbow? No, I, I agree. It's just I think m my response is more of uh, humility, <laughs> maybe unwillingness to take on that. I don't yeah. know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you want to speak a little bit about what you're doing now? What projects you're working on now? Um, I'm um, working, I'm about to do a private commission in DC. Um, and after that, I'm doing a museum show in Jacksonville, Moca. And is the Conduit Gallery show oh, still up? right, yeah. So the Conduit show is still up. So here's a um, surprise for everybody. <laughs> Um, yeah, <laughs> you hear the woe. <laughs> so, what happened here? Well, so it was my first. Like I've been showing, 
in Dallas for the past, what, eight, seven years or something like that? Eight, seven years? Seven, eight years. Um, so I figured a lot of people in Dallas already know what I do. So I kind of thought it would be a good opportunity to experiment um, with uh, with grace and silver. And um, I was a little bit I was I was scared about it. <laughs> um, I, I you know for the first five years of doing this work, I really didn't do mock-ups or tests because I really didn't have the space or I didn't have the time or uh, so the experimentation was done on site uh, which still happens uh, but now that I have a studio like I did tons of tests for this piece <laughs> because um, I did some tests that were really flat and I was like just felt were really boring and um, so when I came to the right idea um, I was like, okay, and this was not like um, it was not decided until like three weeks before the show, which is rare because usually, you know, the, the, the installations take so much planning ahead and discussions and um, meetings with um, uh, Installers at the like uh, museum staff and stuff like that, and um, the the once I come to the space, there's like a full plan, and I can't really deviate from that. So um, many times it's just decided months in advance. Um, but for this was kind of like, and I I kind of tortured um, the gallery team because I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I don't know if you can tell from the slide, but the, some of the thread is metallic. Right, so it's silver, and uh, and it, it's also interesting because of the striped effect. It's uh, it's also a new development uh, for the past three installations. Um, there's actually nine shades of gray, but your eye sort of blends. It, it tricks you. It's almost seems like there's only two. Well, I encourage every, everybody to go see it because um, it is ethereal in the way yeah. that ours is. But different. Well, it's very different because uh, you have the metallic, which, uh, depending on the angle, completely disappears, and then it really flashes you. Uh, so it, it, it's quite... Um, uh, it's exciting. We had, we had a school group today, um, thanks to Danielle, who asked, uh, do you ever, you ever experience failures? Um, <laughs> what do you do with the thread when yeah. you bungle something? Um, well, yeah, um, I do experience problems from time to time. And um, usually, they're, for the most part, they're really minor ones. And um, I actually collect that thread, and they become little pieces. They're called... You can say it. <laughs> Fuck ups. <laughs> um, they are these little blurts of that remind me of watching the Pink Panther. Uh, did you guys? <laughs> can, I was a kid. Um, <laughs> so uh, I actually have. I have a piece that's called the biggest fuck up, which is, uh, I mean, sometimes, you know, like the, the installation process, we are, you know, stretching thread back and forth. The, the, it builds up a lot of tension, and people don't believe me that it's a lot of, like, oh, it's just thread. And um, So whenever installation people don't believe me, and they just don't hit the anchor, and not, they don't hit the studs, or they... Um, Things happen. <laughs> so um, uh, that piece, which is only about this big, actually, it's, it's not um, that big of a. It's not that big, but at the time, it, it was really the biggest um, mess up, <laughs> and it, we had actually started installing, and it ripped off the wall, and yeah. we had to start over. It's not for the. Luckily, it was. Part. It's not. No. Um, it, it also. Um, you know, I mean, I think I've gotten pretty good at really wearing people down and telling them, yeah, it's a lot of tension. And, and actually, I have more um, idea of what that tension is now. 
So I can tell him it's you know it's 1,200 pounds. It really needs to be anchored and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So at this point, I think. Um...